I don't usually have the camera on, but Coco wanted to come say what's up. You're watching the Daily Stock Market Brief. My name is Michael. This is Coco. Today's episode is a quarterly and monthly recap. We have some shocking charts to go over, so let's get into it. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. We're going to start off looking at some seasonality charts because this is going to better help us understand what to expect in July and the coming months, seeing how this is more of a bigger picture uh, view on the market. So as you can see here from a seasonality perspective, we're coming into July starting tomorrow, and typically you get uh, post-election years, you get some pretty big moves, right? And this is something that we called out about April. We saw that move. It matched that seasonality script. We talked about it in May, how it was rather flat, and really... We talked about it in June too, seen as you typically get some sort of a pullback. That did not match the seasonality script either on the average year and or the post-election year. So perhaps there's always a possibility that we do not get this rally in July. However, there are some charts that really suggest that this momentum can continue. So it's, it's a little bit of a red flag, but not quite. We're moving into this month with already all-time highs in the various markets, and this does suggest higher moves. But like I said, we never got that pullback, really significant size pullback in June. We did get a small one after the FOMC meeting. Let's let's look a little bit more deeper into seasonality. So this right here is the percent of months in which the S&P 500 closed higher than it opened. Now we're looking at 20 years here. So you can see here in July, 68% of the time, the months closed higher than from where it opened. And typically it was around 1.3% up. Okay, so it's typically a pretty bullish month overall. If you look at the NASDAQ, 2.5% is up. So typically you have a little bit more strength in the NASDAQ. And then if you look at the INDU, 1.5%. So you get some strength there too. So overall across the boards, I didn't bring the IWM or the Russell uh, 2000 in here. Um, I, I just forgot to, but you got, uh, you know, typically overall across the board, it's, it's quite bullish. Now, this chart here is from Julius de Kempner, and I really liked how he created this chart. It allows you to see um, a little bit better view of the percent of stocks that, so let me just break it down. So he highlighted a few boxes here, okay? Each, each we're coming into July, so these numbers here represent the percent of times that the sector outperformed the S&P 500. So you can see here, XLRE, that's real estate, 72% of the time, it outperformed the S&P 500 in July. Okay, so that's one to remember there because that's the highest number across the board, suggesting that we typically will see strength in uh, real estate coming July. Now, we don't know the percentage yet, but we'll look at it. And then if you take a look at XLC, that's uh, communications, July is about 67% of the time it outperforms the S&P 500. So from a seasonality perspective, you want to find sectors that are typically more strong. Okay, uh, and then you have XLK, which is technology 60%. That's, you know, it's 50% is kind of a, a, that's, you know, hit or miss, you know, coin toss, you can call it. So 10, you know, 10% above that, it's a little bit of a coin toss. So you want to look a little bit more stronger. And then you can see here real estate for the following couple months after that, you have a 61% and then it dies off there in September. Uh, August here in communications is only 25, whereas technology is, uh, you know, 60, 65. So it's, it's, it's pretty decent. Now, one thing that I do want to call out is energy. Look at energy. Energy has this red circle around it that he marked. It outperforms the S&P 500 45% of the times in July and in August. So it's kind of a coin toss, but it's more in a bearish. Um, it, it seems as if the S&P 500 can outperform energy in the coming months. So if we look at the percentage point gains that they typically get here, you can look at communications at you know 0.5% outperformance. You have XLRE. It's typically 1.7% in July. Uh, so that you know that's a that's a good sign. These are relatively small numbers, except for XLRE. XLRE that's a pretty large percentage point move. So a big focus coming into July and August should be uh, around real estate. Now we we're going to look at some rotation graphs, also developed by Julius De Kemper, to see how those will perform as well. Um, notice here on XLK, it's pretty much flatlined right there. Same with August, pretty much flatlined. So. Not much to report there. Another thing that I want to call out, though, is if you look at energy, typically in July, minus 1.4% on average to the downside. And that's a you know pretty big hit there if, you, if you're heavy on energy stocks coming into July. Now, I don't know, like I said, if it's going to match its seasonality script. 
Um, but we'll be going into some various charts here because the energy to me looks very, very strong. But from a seasonality perspective, you know, it suggests otherwise. Utilities also, okay, this is more of a defensive uh, defensive sector here, typically on average down 1.1% in July. All right, so let's look at some rotation graphs. Um, these were also, like I said, developed by Julius DeKempner. Um, you can find these on stockcharts.com. I'm looking at a weekly time frame right here. Now we say that energy is typically weaker right into July. That's the, the information that we were provided. Uh, but you can see here, it's on a weekly basis. We're looking at a nine week tail here, very long tail. And these last four or five weeks, it has been ramping pretty much vertical headed towards the leading um, the leading quadrant there. And you can see that it's on the right side of this uh, cross right here, which which means um, that it is outperforming the S&P 500. So that, to me, is sending a little bit of a mixed signal. Meanwhile, you could look at XLRE. That is pointing down, so it looks like it's trying to curve down and weaken a little bit, but it is still performing um, in the leading quadrant. One of the only, actually, it is the only sector as of right now. This other one, communication, so XLC, you can see here it's from improving, heading towards that leading. So that does match that seasonality script that we saw on the previous slides. Communications, this is a little bit of a red flag, seeing how it's been such a strong, um, sector, it could be getting a little bit overextended, but from a weekly rotation standpoint, this is a little bit concerning. You have utilities also, it's been improving, but it started to curve back down, which is never a good thing. And it's heading towards that lagging quadrant going into July. So it does meet, um, it, it matches up with what we saw on the previous slide there. Uh, so those are a couple ones that I want to just call out there. If we look at the daily time frame, this is obviously not as big a picture, but you can see here XLB, XLF, XLI, XLU, uh, XLP, sorry, not XLU. All of those in the shorter term are pointing up to trying to get to improve. So as they're kind of rotating around here, we'll see if that momentum continues in the weeks to come. It's uncertain at this particular point in time. XLK has been leading, but it is heading down to slightly going uh, right here. So we'll also watch that. And then uh, where's that energy one hiding out? XLI, XLE right here. You can see on the shorter term, it is lagging and it's heading more towards that lagging quadrant, that corner there too as well. So XLC on the shorter term, it looks like it's really just paused right here. There's not even a long tail in the last eight trading days. So overall, you can see from a seasonality perspective, one, from a larger point of view, July is typically a strong performer. When you break it down, what are the typically stronger sectors? Well, we saw that, you know, the percent of times that each sector, you know, takes the highest percentage point gains is in, uh, sorry, not the highest percentage point gains, the the percentage at which they outperform the S&P 500, the XLRE has the highest ranking going into July. 72% of the time, it outperforms the overall broad market. And then you have also XLC um, and XLK. However, XLC and XLRE are the only ones from a weekly basis that look to be in the leading quadrant. So those are very important sectors to probably be mindful of and to be careful for is most likely going to be energy, it's showing a little bit of a mixed signal, um, and then also utilities. All right, let's hop into the markets. How I broke this down is we're going to look at monthly timeframes and then quarterly timeframes, and then we're going to get into some stock market indicators that help us uh, give us a more shorter term to longer term view of everything too as well. So I'm going to be going through these rather quickly. Let's start with the monthly timeframe, S&P 500. You can see here just ramping higher and higher, close at a monthly all-time high. RSI is getting a little bit overbought, a little bit extended from the five uh, monthly EMA. So it's always important to look for a potential reconnect. This is going to be moving up starting next month. The price is above it, it's pointing up. We'll see what that number is as it stands right now. It's at 4,100. Any concerns? At this particular point in time, we're seeing a lot of strength. It's right around the upper Bollinger Band. It's not quite overextended. The only thing that I really did want to point out here was um, the histogram here on the price percent oscillator actually ticked down this month, which I thought was interesting. So perhaps this is the early stage of a potential arcing um, or you know a potential more of a, a decline here in the histogram, which being a monthly time frame that could take a very long time to play out. But it is something just worth noting. These last three months too had a little bit of an uptick in volume. You can see low volume to a little bit higher to a little bit higher volume there. But overall, you know, looking back through the chart, it's 
relatively average volume. Here's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. We were watching that five monthly EMA. We did reconnect with it and we found some strong support. This is you know, a pretty nasty looking candle. This could be considered a topping candle. Uh, I would like to have seen it a little bit higher up in order to really be considered a topping candle. So I'm not going to put too much weight on it as of right now. It's still an overall very bullish context. The RSI is getting a little bit overextended. We had some volume. Yeah, volume's kind of average in the histogram, kind of ticked down just slightly there. But you can see the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones were trading right at around the upper Bollinger Band there. Transports, this is what I find very interesting, okay? Notice the divergence taking place between industrials and transports. Transports were down 5.52% for the month. Meanwhile, the Dow Jones was not even down point, not even down, it was down, it was pretty much flat, okay? It was down 26.94, which is 0.08%, okay? These divergences are never a good thing. If you look at Dow theory, you'll understand a little bit more why. We had the shooting star candle right here. You can see here, it had follow through to the downside. The monthly five EMA did hold as support. So we'll continue to watch to see if that develops. We had an uptick in volume as we had that selling pressure increase, but not a big, like big red candle by any means to spoof. You know, like it, it wasn't anything like this candle right here. We had this big dramatic you know, move to the downside in a lot of volume. Histogram there is pointing down to as well. Looks like it's trying to curl itself over. So we'll see here what transports decide to do coming into next month. As it stands right now, um, first off, the low of this candle, be very careful we start getting below that. The low is at 14, uh, 587. So if we start cracking down through that, that would be a little bit more confirmation that we can head lower. We would need a monthly close. Keep in mind, guy, right? it can go down, it can create a hammer candle, then bounce back. But I would definitely be um, very, very cautious if it does start cracking down through that monthly 5 EMA or the low of this previous monthly candle right there, because that could be some continuation that we see to the downside in transports. But right now, as it stands, it's holding as support from this previous resistance, support monthly 5 EMA too as well. So from a risk versus reward standpoint, if you think that the market's going to continue to press higher, you'd be getting transports at a discount. Like I said, it's down almost 6% this month. NDX, so the NASDAQ 100. Very strong month, monthly close at an all-time high, almost closed on the top tick there. Uh, you know, we had a high at 14,582, but we closed at 14,554. So just a few points off there, up 6.34%. You can see the volume doesn't really support this move. And the histogram has been declining here and flattening out as the market presses higher. So a very interesting divergence taking place as the RSI continues to press higher. We're still uh, not at the upper range of that Bollinger Band. This type of move suggests that we can potentially press higher here. So just be mindful of that. I wouldn't try to be shorting this specific, you know, from, from this kind of a time frame, but you know, it's just it's just getting overextended overall, and there's a couple of red flags. But price action is king, so we're just going to follow price. And currently, it's up. Semiconductors really did help out here, up 5.24% in the SMH, which is the semiconductors ETF. This one broke out to all-time highs, closed at all-time highs. We have some declining volume and the histograms flattening out too as well. Meanwhile, the RSI is getting very, very frothy at 87.29. And, you know, we're not too far off from hitting that upper Bollinger Band. And the upper Bollinger Band is at, uh, where are we at for the upper? 277.58. And we're at, right, we closed at 266. So, you know, if we go up a few more points, just be very mindful of that number because you can get um, pivot points from those areas if semiconductors continue to make its run. If you look at the Russell 2000, we've been having a lot of indecision candles up here. Uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. It's the 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 monthly five EMA has been holding as a level of support. We'll see where that brings us tomorrow. Overall, the, you could consider this consolidation, but these long lower wicks means to me that the bears have been making a little bit of progress, but let's see if the bulls can kind of continue to hold it together. Um, we'll go into the financials here shortly. Histogram there is dying off too as well. So if this doesn't start correcting itself, it's not looking that great for the IWM. Still suggest upside momentum, right? We had a, a, a close for the month at an all-time high. That's never bearish if you're following price. This is, you know, just a lot of indecision, a lot of small range bodies. Typically, what this means is you get these big green candles, boom, 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 and then you get smaller range candles and smaller bodies, suggesting that momentum is either um, dying down 
and or it's obviously a period of consolidation. And if momentum is dying down, it's either price is going to correct or time is going to help consolidate so you can have a continued move higher. The BKX, this is a big move here, down 6.29% and you know the markets didn't feel this at all typically when you get the banks have a lot of pressure to the downside you know it can stumble up the equity markets right so for example the iwm 20 percent of its holdings are in financials this was up 1.87 percent for the month this uh the the banks this is the bkx was down 6.29 percent now this is interesting okay you got to look at like the transports for example Th that's a huge 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 piece to the economy and to the markets if you see transports lagging like this and it doesn't affect the markets and then you get the financial institutions taking huge hits too you can see you know down 6.29 percent and the markets aren't stumbling on this either these are leading us as an indicator or there's some just 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 some very like obviously there's a lot of divergences taking place so you need to just be what i'm trying to get at is you need to be very careful seeing these divergences take place you want to see these move hand in hand together um, now what is interesting from a bullish perspective is if these start picking up strength going into july and the following months that can really melt up the s p 500 and the various other markets that are supported by transports and also financials um, if we do start seeing those get a lot more strength however right you got the histogram pointing down bearish candle held at the 5 ema we have some support right at around 114.50 to 115 if you look oh sorry i'm gonna bring up the dax for uh no i'll bring up tnx then we'll go into the dax if you look at yields this is something that you also want to pay attention to we're looking at the tnx it's 10-year treasury yield okay we're at uh we're down down 8.73 percent okay if this is down, you got to understand the correlation right here taking place. This was down 8.73%. The banks did poorly too as well. Why is that? What's the correlation there? Well, when yields go low, banks make less margin, but banks do very well, especially um, when the 10-year, the 30-year, when they rise is because they borrow short-term and they lend long-term. And what we've been seeing here is we're seeing these short-term yields go higher and the long-term yields starting to head down, which flattens the curve. It starts pointing south and that is not good for financials. What that has been good for has been technology stocks. You can see here as TNX has been heading down, technology is pressing higher and higher. Now we close right at around the monthly 5 EMA here. This is curling itself down right here too, which could suggest a period of consolidation and or we're starting to reverse ourselves here a little bit from a monthly time frame. The, you know, right at around 1.2 or 12 on the TNX, that could be in level of support. Now there's this whole, is it is inflation transitory? Is it not transitory? We're in this sideways chop these last four months. We don't, it's like the market doesn't really know what to do. If inflation, you know, is transitory or if, sorry, if inflation is just not permanent, I feel like the market would be lower, like around one to 1.1, 1 .1, you know, this range down here. But if they did believe that it is permanent or inflation is actually transitory, I feel like the market would be pressing it higher. So it's almost as if these last three months, the market is saying, I don't really know yet. Uh, and that's, you know, just one interpretation and, you know, the market, my opinion doesn't mean anything. Just watch what the market does. If we start heading lower, the narrative of it is transitory is going to be more widely held. And, you know, it's something that we'll have to be, be monitoring. Uh, when you think that inflation isn't a thing though, actually, sorry, let me go to the TNA, uh, the DAX, the DAX, this is uh, important to point out histogram is a slight, slight downgrade here. And you have a lot like a not a shooting star, but an indecision type candle as it tagged the upper Bollinger Band and we're disconnected from the monthly 5 EMA. So this does look like it wants to potential reconnect here soon, but you got to understand the big candles moving up and then these small range candles suggest slowing momentum. Okay. Okay. So the CRB, if if you believe that inflation is not, you know, it's, it's not here. I mean, just look at the CRB index. This is just screaming higher and higher. Price percent oscillator just moving straight up here. RSI is not even overbought on the monthly time frame. We're about to get to that upper month or monthly Bollinger Band, and we are disconnected from the uh, five EMA two as well, which is frequently tagged. So to me, as we're breaking out of this, you know, 2018 peak right here, and even you know 2016, 2017, this range, as we're breaking through that. 
uh, you know, you got to wonder this basket of commodities, are they going to just continue pressing higher and higher? And if they are, you know, maybe the bond market, you know, is just, it's lagging right now. And that's, that'd be weird to say because the bond market is, you know, one of the ultimate indicators. It, it, it interprets all the economic data and it prices it in. So as it's very confused, we are seeing various commodities just go through the roof. So the CRB index, like I said, it's just, this could be because of energy and energy is, is a big weight and we'll get into WTIC here shortly. But now another interesting fact is that the dollar showed some very strong strength this month up 2.71%. The price percent oscillator, you can see here looking like it wants to try to cross through that, which suggests to me, if this doesn't start heading lower, the dollar can head higher. That will put pressure on various commodities moving forward. I don't know. I mean, this is interesting because from a seasonality perspective, July is typically weak for energy. All right. And, you know, oil, that'd be interesting to see is, 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 is energy stocks, is oil going to underperform in the month? Well, this is where it's a very interesting type of play because you have a seasonality saying one thing, but you have price telling us another. It's just, it's just very confusing to me. And I would imagine that if the dollar starts breaking from these levels, it's going to put pressure on various commodities. I, and it's hard to say if oil is going to be one of those. Typically, if you do get a big spike in the dollar, that will put pressure on, on oil. But we, we're, we're not seeing that right now. So we'll see. Here's gold. A chart of gold looks just miserable. You can see here, look at the correlation. Big, strong green candle in the dollar big red candle in gold, very strong correlation, bearish engulfing, holding at the 20 monthly uh, simple moving average, which is right in between the Bollinger Bands. This to me, I mean, it still remains intact of this uptrend, but this does not look the greatest. You can see here that selling pressure was done on less volume than the previous month. So that's a good sign, but you want to see if we get confirmation to the downside. This type of candle is not the greatest looking for gold, which if we do get more downside in other videos, I posted where I'd be looking to start buying into more levels because a long term, I believe that the dollar will continue to go down um, and or, or break down or fall apart completely. And then gold will continue to press higher. Uh, but that, you know, could be could be months, years away. We don't know. Let's look at the price of silver. Silver is in this pennant formation. Also not the greatest looking candle. Price percent oscillator looks like it's about to cross down too as the histogram is kind of sloping down there. RSI is pointing down too as well. Held right on the monthly 5 EMA. So as it stands right now, if we start breaking down through the low of this candle at 25.58, we'll call it 25.50, it could suggest a little bit more downside to around 23 to 24 range for silver. But overall, I mean, monthly time frame, you know, it's consolidating here, but you have a, a low, you have a higher low, and then right now it's at another higher low. So we'll see what the next month brings. Uh, the next one I want to call out, obviously, is energy. Energy has been on this, or sorry, not energy. Oil has been on a monster tear. We are tagging the upper Bollinger Band, which suggests that we might see some slowing of momentum as that pairs with an area of resistance right up here too. Okay, once we get into the quarterly charts, you might have a different, you might think of it a little bit differently because it, it does show some, some very, very um, solid strength. And if we start breaking through these levels, it suggests... Nothing's going to hold us back to around $80 to $100 a barrel. So, uh, yeah, it's just crazy to me. Quarterly charts. Let's hop into that. S&P 500. This is where it gets very interesting. We're trading above the upper Bollinger Band. We're overextended. Volume, super, super low comparatively to these last previous quarters throughout 2020. That, to me, is not always a good thing. So, trading above the upper Bollinger Band. Volume's dying off. Overbought. Yikes, doesn't look good. I mean, it's strong as it stands right now, but it just doesn't look great. Same with the Dow Jones Industrial Average, negative divergence on the RSI. Volume has just been kind of just falling off a cliff here as it's trading above the upper Bollinger Band there as well. Transports, look at this. That is a topping candle. Now, we talked about this previous quarter or previous month. This was one solid green candle when we brought that up. Why did we bring it up? Because it was just mind boggling right? It's out. It's completely outside of the upper Bollinger Band. Not one time in history can you go back and see a quarter candle above the upper Bollinger Band. If we start breaking down through this, it suggests more downside movement. The quarterly um, EMA is at 13 
1039 now that's probably going to uptick next quarter when it starts so we'll watch out for that but that can act as a potential pivot area but just know that this is the start of a reversal type pattern this candle you know right so big range big range big range big range small range well i mean it's on a uh, the chart is a little bit skewed so be mindful of that it's still a fairly large range candle right there but the in the the long upper wick suggests that uh there's more demand up there as of now so if we start breaking down through that low just know the low is at 14587 then we might see some more continued downside so be very careful here as we press these all-time quarterly closing highs volume is atrocious nasdaq 100 big green candle right very frothy on the RSI. RSIs can be very extended for quite some time. These last three quarters, we've been trading outside the upper range of the Bollinger Band. This is crazy to me. This is just insane. Typically, you want to get these quarterly reconnects, and the monthly quarterly or quarterly EMA is at right 12,495. I mean, that'd be crazy if we got a reconnect right there because we closed at 14,005. So we're talking, you know, 2,000 point drop could happen very quickly. And that would, you know, that would, would feel like Armageddon here in this in this in market environment. I mean, shoot, you have two percent drawdowns, and people are like, "Oh my God, it's crazy." A volume on the quarter also low comparatively to the other quarters too, as well. A lot of strength coming into the air. Like I said, if we start seeing the um, ten year continue to roll down, this could propel them even further. This to me looks like a massive melt up, blow off kind of top. So we got to be on the lookout for some large, large blow off range candles, exhaustion type candles with just incredible amounts of volume. The DAX here on the, oh, that was the monthly time frame. Sorry, I forgot to bring in the quarterly time frame for that. The semiconductors, look at, use the monthly upper Bollinger Band and monthly, sorry, quarterly EMA the quarterly upper Bollinger Band and the quarterly EMA as an area of support. And we're back above the upper Bollinger Band on the quarterly time frame. So this is extended too. All right. So yeah, if you're buying, just know that you're buying outside of an upper Bollinger Band. Uh, that doesn't happen frequently. And if you get above it, it can go for quite some time, right? Above it, above it, above it. These are quarters too. So it lasts a while, but just know like it, it typically comes back to reconnect frequently. And we'll see if we get a reconnect soon. Just, just be careful. When you're buying up here, you're buying at some crazy highs. Now, the volume these last two quarters is pretty darn strong. So that's a good sign. So we'll continue to watch this on the shorter time frames. We just got to be very mindful as where you're buying um, in the grand scheme of things here. IWM, also a little bit of a hanging man candle. RSI is overbought. Volume, it's irrelevant right here compared to last month. This could be just, an, it, it is an inside trading quarter. So, you know, perhaps this was a, just a quarterly break right here. It's taking a little consolidation. And if all of a sudden we get volume stepping in, hey, we have an inside trading candle, boom, we can break out. So watch for the breakout, obviously. But if we start breaking down through the low of the quarter candle, then be a little bit careful, obviously. Here's the BKX. This is the banking on the quarterly time frame. Shooting star type candle. You can see it got above the upper Bollinger Band, came back, traded within it, disconnected from the uh, quarterly five EMA two as well. We'll see where that comes. We did have the bullish crossover here. So perhaps this is the start of a larger move. Now these are big candles, right? Big range candles. It's slowing momentum here slightly. Um, so we'll continue to water, monitor and see how it develops here. Like I said, these are bearish looking candles, but we did just break out. We're in bullish context, bullish crossover. So you need to wait for confirmation. It's not like something you would just go short. If you look at the TNX, 10 year on the quarterly time frame inside trading candle price percent oscillator on the quarterly time frame is curling up so this suggests that okay maybe we might see some short-term weakness where would the weakness go well potentially to the quarterly 5 ema and then it might find support well where's the quarterly 5 ema right now that's at uh, 1328 so that means you know 1.3 on the 10 year to me that's more than possible and if it finds support there which that's going to be moving up next month well, guess what? We might find, like I said, might find some support that does align with this previous dip and this dip and we move from those points. And then guess what? If we start moving higher, well, that, I mean, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the equity markets. Um, you know, you, you could see very well some strong strength out of financials, but the the, the tech sector, which is a big weighting, um, could, could see some very, very uh, just aggressive weakness. CRB index from the quarterly time frame. Look at just these big monster green candles as it creep, keeps trucking up here. It's breaking out of this area, this period of consolidation. This to me is very bullish. We had the bullish crossover. It's still below zero. RSI now is above 50. 
This to me says, like, why can't it go higher? All right, so why can't this head higher? And I, you know, I mean, from a relative basis, looking back here, I mean, okay, I can get why people don't think inflation, you know, it's, I can see why they don't think it's permanent. I mean, there's a long way to go, but if this keeps pressing higher and higher and our basket of commodities continues to get more expensive and we're watching the CPI numbers come out, you have to think like, is it transitory? Is it not? It, are we are we going to come into some stagflationary environment? How is the Fed going to fix this? Are they going to you know taper? Are they actually going to taper? I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll watch the markets. I, I I I just don't believe that they are in a position to with the amount of debt I, l- raising interest rates with with larger and larger amounts of debt um, by the you know second to me is just it's a very dangerous dangerous thing. So they they are stuck in this very very difficult you know, rock between a hard place, whatever the saying is. Um, U.S. dollar on the quarterly time frame, hammer candle on a pullback. Uh-oh, it's finding support right at around this 90 marker. All right, that's not bearish, but it is below the quarterly EMA. So you want to see that cross back above and get some confirmation to see some potential more upside. Uh, so it's not there yet, but you can see the bulls did step in. It's been crazy, right? The bears then the bulls, then the bears, then the bulls right back, okay? So if we start getting above this uh, quarterly 5 EMA, it's at 93.95, uh, right at around, you know, 93, we'll call it 93.5. If we start getting above that, uh, there's nothing to say that the dollar can't start, you know, quickly go to 96 there. If you look at gold on the quarterly time frame, not the greatest looking candle, but it's not horrible, uh, you know, right? It's, it could be potentially still flagging here on the quarterly time frame. We, we came up, look where we tagged. We tagged the upper Bollinger Band, right? And then the bears found that as an area of supply. They started dumping into the market. And now we close right at the quarterly 5 EMA. So we'll continue to watch this and see what develops. If it starts breaking down through the low of this candle or the quarterly candle, then I'd be a little bit, um, I wouldn't be scared, but I would start looking at areas to potentially buy those specific dips. If you're in the camp that you believe that the price of uh, the metals and commodities will be going up in long term. Quarterly chart for silver, you can see here, strong move. It's been consolidating sideways. It got clearly above the upper Bollinger Band. It's done that multiple times. One time that looks very familiar is when it got strong, very, very strong over, over, overextended here and then put a shooting star candle. Then we got confirmation, got closed below the low, and you can see it started heading lower. So be careful if that's the thing here, if it starts getting below the low of this shooting star type candle and the low of this candle, which is right at around 22, because that would suggest that there is more downside to come in the price of silver. Not there yet. Um, d- uh, oil, here's the quarterly chart for oil. Bullish crossover right here. RSI is back above 50. This to me is looking pretty strong, right? We're coming into this area of resistance just right overhead, which is in confluence, confluence with the upper Bollinger Band. If we start breaking through that, it can suggest more upside. All right, I've been going on for a while right now because there's so many charts. Indicators, NIMO, the NIMO reading right here. Notice here, it's negative breadth again as the market's still pressing higher and higher. Every time we see these peaks as of recent, like look at this big peak right here, it was on negative breadth and it corrected. Right here also, negative breadth, you know, pretty much moving up into all of this area and it just it just dragged higher and higher and then it corrected. So it's just scary, scary stuff right here. So just be mindful of what is actually taking place. You can see here the NIMON is another reading. You can see the NIA, the, the NIZI New York Stock Exchange cracked down and went to back test and now it's trying to decide whether where it, where it wants to go right here. And as it presses up a little bit higher, the reading's relatively low um, for where the price action actually is. The internals of the market, the NIAD for the day, for the last couple of days, also still in divergence. You can see the internals are weakening as the S&P 500 pressed to all-time highs. This divergence too as well, we're looking at S&P 500 and then the ratio between the SPX over the TLT. You can see it's putting in a lower high, S&P 500 is putting in a higher high. And typically when you get this, you can get, um, I mean, they can diverge for a while, but you can also see movements to the downside. So look at a BP chart, BP NDX still suggests that there's more room to go to the upside. Be careful when we get there because it's getting overextended both from an absolute perspective, meaning looking at the chart, and it's getting there from a signal perspective as well. A couple red flags also for the NASDAQ. If you look at the new highs or on all time highs, look at the chart. It's just horrific readings comparatively to these last highs. Boom, those were higher. This high, boom, significantly higher. So just a big divergence taking place there. And if you look at the new high, new lows, same thing. 
high, very, very low. This high was higher. This high was even higher. So diver just, just weakening internals. Something that is good is the NASDAQ uh, percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average. We did see that breadth thrust there. So more stocks started to go into this, this play that we saw this big move to the upside. Uh, it is slightly curling down here, and we still do have a negative divergence, but at least there was some supporting stocks to help move the market up higher. Now let's look at the BPSBX chart. It did get out of that oversold condition. Um, I don't know if I, I mixed oversold and overbought up. This is oversold conditions. If I said overbought previously, my bad. Oversold, it bounced out of those conditions. We call that out. We did see that move higher. We'll see here if it starts pull, pulling, pulling itself back down, create some sort of positive divergence, or if it does something similar that it did in early 2020 or in September. If you look at the percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average, we are at 48%, which is pretty darn low for the market to continue to press higher. This can suggest a few things. This can suggest that if we get all these stocks that are, below the 50-day moving average, start to see some strength, that can give us a big melt up here in July and really add to the mo uh, the seasonality script. But just call it for what it is right now. You have the market moving higher, but you have a lot of internal weakness. It's almost like a stealth bear market taking place. If you look at the lumber to gold ratio, Michael Guyad's white paper, if you go read that if you haven't read it. I've interviewed him on this channel. Well below zero, heading lower as of right now. This can take weeks to see a potential risk um, event happen, or it could be a false signal. He doesn't believe that it is. If he looks at uh, the utilities over SPY, this um, has not triggered to risk off. There's been a lot of mixed signals about risk on and risk off. This one has not triggered yet. He believes that it potentially can here in the months to come. Now, typically utilities in the month of July are weak. All right, so if it's out underperforming the S&P 500, we might not see this triggered there in July, but perhaps maybe, you know, seasonality script, it didn't play off like we saw in June. So we don't, we don't really know here, but all we do know is where it's at right now. And it's suggesting that, yes, we have the risk off signal between the lumber to gold ratio, but it has not been flipped over here for utilities as at this particular moment. And utilities are that really defensive defensive play here. If we look at the VIX, the volatility index on the weekly time frame, it tagged the lower range of this wedge. And this structure, you can't tell me it's not important because it's tagging it darn near perfectly. Boom, 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 every single time. Create a little bit of a hammer candle, which suggests if we start breaking up to the upside, that's going to also be some sort of volatility event. This can hold for a long time, right? We're looking at the weekly time frame. We'll continue to monitor this, but if it just continues to Go, you know, just drift down lower. We have a couple open gaps still beneath us on this time frame too, as well. And if you look at what asset managers are doing right now, um, not much. They did pull back from their, you know, higher reading in previous weeks, but right around 70%. And then if you look at the the right X um, right here, it's at 0.9, so it's still suggesting very bullish. So overall. Uh, very bullish sentiment, um, but it was, it's not it's not as extreme as it once was here just you know a couple prior weeks ago. All right, everybody, I went over a lot of charts, okay? This is my conclusion, wrapping it up. Seasonality script, is it going to play off in July? You need to follow what the price is telling you as of right now, and it suggests that it will play. So what sectors are the ones that we should be looking at? It looks like real estate is typically strong in July and communications, both from a seasonality perspective, an absolute perspective is pretty darn good. Um, and then that rotation perspective as well. So if you want to find performing stocks, that is a safe bet. Always manage your risk. From a monthly and quarterly charting perspective, understand where you are in the grand scheme of things, looking at something like the Bollinger Bands. We are at these very, very high, if not way overextended readings. So be very careful. We have two divergences that are worth noting. Equities in the banking um, sector, they saw a big drawdown, right? Almost 6%, I think it was. And then you have transports too that are also diverging significantly. So if the Russell 2000 is holding up, the IWM and banks are going down and 20% of the IWM holdings is financials, maybe that's an early warning sign or perhaps if we start seeing strength, if the the 10 year, you know, starts moving up a little bit, but we don't know yet, but just understand those divergences and the various ones that we showed on stock market indicators, uh, section. Um, it's, it's just, uh, it's a very, very dangerous, dangerous time. So you just need to be bullish. You need to be cautious and, you know, don't throw, like I said, I've been saying caution to the wind here because if, if a risk off event happens, um, it can happen very aggressively and very quickly. 
We've seen it take place before, right? Um, and you do not want to get trapped in an environment quite like that. All right, that's all I got for you, everybody.